Now, who says that MLS isn't the best league in the world? Now, don't just take my advice from it. Let me provide the stats of the scores that happened this weekend to back that up. Our first game was New York City versus Portland Timbers, and Portland Timbers are still on fire as they sco scored late on in like the 94th minute to win the game 2-1 after being 1-0 down. Toronto still have not conceded a goal against Charlotte as Insigne popped up and scored to make that 1-0. Philadelphia against Seattle was a 0-0 draw. Technically, got suspended because the pitch was just waterlogged at Subaru Park. It was absolutely horrendous, the weather. And how anyone even thought that game could go ahead is beyond me, but good job it was suspended. Although not evidence to back this up that the MLS is the best league in the world was Orlando versus Minnesota. The game that had the fastest goal in the MLS with 14 seconds with Maguire popping up to put Orlando in the lead. And then in the 92nd, 93rd minute, Minnesota win the game 3-2 with a kick, a long ball over the top, and then the ball is put away for a 3-2 victory. Atlanta absolutely demolished New England in a 4-1 victory. Columbus beat Chicago in what was the latest goal ever scored in the MLS history as well. 20 plus 8, Columbus actually won that game against Chicago. Then we have the beautiful New York Red Bulls with Emil Forsberg getting his first goal, although it was a penalty and kind of a poor one. He's on the score sheet, he's opened his check and account as a good goal. Austin versus St. Louis finished 2-2, which was impressive. Colorado managed to win away against Real Salt Lake to win 2-1. Vancouver also won away to win 2-0 against San Jose. LAFC drew with Sport in Kansas 0-0, which is uh, kind of worrying for them. They've not hit the ground running the start of the season, but they can still pick up at a later point. Nashville LA Galaxy. Now, Nashville were actually 2 up. LA Galaxy managed to come back. After missing a penalty in the first half, that would have put them 1-0 up. They managed to get the draw 2-2 in this game. Cincinnati DC, we expected goals potentially, but I did say Cincinnati were really good defensively, and that's what they stuck to that game finish 0-0. Perhaps the game of the weekend, which is Inter Miami versus Montreal. Messi, Suarez, Busquets, but no, Jordi Alba did play. Messi, Suarez, and Busquets did not play in this game. Well, didn't start in this game at least. Messi wasn't even on the bench. Suarez and Busquets came in, and what was they thought was going to be the turning tide in this game because this game went. 1-0 Montreal, then it went 1-1, then it went 2-1 Montreal, then it went 2-2, and Montreal won it in the end with a 3-2 victory to give Inter Miami their first defeat. Now with all the fixtures out of the way, let's have a guess of ball. Now with all the excellent games to pick, it's really hard to narrow it down to three, where we've got that down to a team. We're going to start off with Montreal and Inter Miami game at Inner Miami where their first loss was handed. Now, to give you a timeline of the game, in the 13th minute Montreal went 1-0 up. And then in the 71st minute, Leonardo Campana for Inter Miami got a goal back 1-1. Then just literally minutes later, in the 75th minute, 2-1 Montreal. 75th minute, and I actually said it wrong earlier on what happened in this game and its fixtures. It was the 78th minute, Montreal went 3-1 up before Jordi Alba scored two minutes after that. In the 78th minute, 3-1, 80th minute, 3-2. And it was actually a super, super goal by Jordi Alba. How he scored this and how he actually put that in is unbelievable. It's kind of like FIFA stuff right there. But the game finished 3-2 and Miami could not break through. But did the stats show that? Who was a better team on the field? Did Montreal counter-attack or did Inter Miami not really have the attacking force that they normally do? Well, the stats. Inter Miami had 14 shots. Montreal had 12. They both had four on target, though. Being clinical, four on target, three goals, four on target, two goals. Scoring 50% still pretty clinical. But Montreal were just more clinical and getting 75% of their shots on target into the back of the net. In possession in Miami absolutely dominated with 61% possession and 39 to Montreal. It shows that you don't need possession to win games, you just need to counter attack. That used to be the Red Bulls way, but that's the Montreal way now. And that was a great performance for them to get that win on the road at in Miami to hand them their first defeat as well. Now our next game has to be Nashville versus LA Galaxy. Now Nashville had a really tough game against Inter Miami in the CONCAF Cup before this game. They were 2-0 up and then came back, Inter Miami came and drew 2-2. But then this kind of happened again. There's a reoccurring theme here is Nashville went 2-0 up with Teal Bunbury scoring another penalty. Everyone's hating, but he scored two penalties now. He's putting the ball away. He's getting goals. That's all that matters. Then Drew Yearwood scored in the 58th minute. So Teal Bunbury penalty in the 54th minute. Drew Yearwood in the 58th. 2-0 after LA Galaxy missed a penalty in the first half as well. Then Ricky Pug, the man who LA Galaxy has now built around scores in the 67th minute. And then in the 82nd minute, Dolovic, or however you pronounce his name, who missed the penalty in the first half, gets the goal to tie the game up. Now it looked like LA Galaxy really should have went on to win this game, but the stats will show that more. 13 shots to Nashville, 19 shots to LA Galaxy. 4 on target for Nashville, 8. 8 on target for LA Galaxy. That's insane and they were kind of unlucky not to get all three points on the road at Nashville but it's a good sign from Nashville in a sense of scoring goals but not a good sense in how much they're conceding they're really ones to watch in terms of how leaky they've been at defense I thought they'd be pretty solid this season 
Possession, 37% possession to Nashville, 63 to LA Galaxy at Nashville's turf as well. That's not how you want to play at home and blown a two, two goal lead. Some things need to change at Nashville, but Sam Surge came back and Hanny Mokhtar was in this team lineup, so maybe things will start to change for them once they get the CONCACAF out of the way. If they manage to beat Miami in Miami, be an interesting one. And our final game has to be one that wasn't really spoken about too much, and that is a 4-1 victory for Atlanta against New England. A lot of this action didn't really happen until the second half, but whereas in the 45 plus 2, Thiago Amanda scored a penalty to put Atlanta 1-0 up at the half going into the game, or the second half. Where Yakimakis then took a penalty in the 55th minute, Yakimakis again didn't take a penalty but scored in the 60th minute, and in the 74th minute he scores a hat-trick. A 20 minute hat trick in Yakimakis for the second half to put the game 4 0 at that point, where Gill for New England got a goal back to make it 4 1, but it didn't really count for much in the 83rd minute. How did the stats look in this game though? Well, the stats kind of back up the scoreline as Atlanta had 21 shots, New England had 14. Atlanta had 9 on target and scored 4 goals. They could have potentially scored 9 goals in this game, they could have scored a lot more with the chances they had. Whereas New England had five, 5 on target, so potentially if they had just had better chances, they would have scored a lot more goals, but they did not. That's not how it works in this game of football. Possession stats, maybe this is an example that Nashville should follow. It doesn't take possession to win games in your own turf. 44% for Atlanta, 56 to New England. Now there was so many games we could have picked from Columbus to score in that late winner to Portland to Vander's goal. Where he scored against New York City. There's a lot of action to jam pack, but we picked the kind of highest score in the most exciting games. It happened this weekend. Let me know what game you think was deserved a talking point spot, but for now, embrace excitement.